Hello and good day to you. My name is David Kassoff, and on behalf of Kepner Trigo, I want to thank you for attending our webinar, 8D Problem Solving, and how the German Association for the Automotive Industry, also known as the VDA, recommends KT is and is not. Before we dive into the presentation, I have just a few housekeeping items. We'd love to have you engage with us. We'll ask you to participate in a few polls and would love to answer questions that come to mind. The polls will be initiated by our presenter and will be simple to use. For questions, simply submit these using the Ask a Question button you'll find located just beneath your Bright Talk player. There will be a Q&A section, but please do submit questions as you think of them. In the attachments area, you'll find today's presentation, details for a case study that will be presented, a link to Kepner Trigo's 8D services, and the VDA's Red Book. The attachments tab is located just next to the Ask a Questions tab. Please go there now to make sure you can access this. At the end of this week, we'll send by email a copy of the slides and a recorded version of this presentation. Please do feel free to share this with your colleagues. We want to know if you found this webinar valuable. So at the end, please take a moment to rate this session by clicking the Rate This button, also found on your Bright Talk player. So speaking to us from Berlin, Germany, your presenter, Burkhardt Prigget, has been with Kepner Trigo since 2011. He is an electrical engineer and an industrial engineer and is responsible for Kepner Trigo's services in the German market. We are excited to have him with us today. So again, thank you very much for spending time with us. And I'll now turn this over to the very capable hands of Mr. Burkhard Prigge. Thank you, David. Uh, before we get started, a few words about Kepner Trigo. The company was founded in 1958 by Drs. Charles Kepner and Benjamin Trago, two American behavioral scientists, who have recognized that the process of successfully solving a variety of different problems can be traced back to a handful of fundamental thinking processes. We operate worldwide and convey these thinking processes to our customers through training and coaching in both face-to-face -face sessions and online via the Internet. We also come to our customers' premises and personally moderate the analysis of the most difficult problems right there. And we advise our customers, especially on questions of how they can establish efficient problem solving in their companies. The photo, by the way, shows the rocket launch of Apollo 13 in 1970. During its journey to the moon, one of the oxygen tanks exploded and NASA used the Kepner Trigo processes, among other things, to quickly find the cause of the resulting voltage drop. Actions could be taken to get the astronauts back alive to Earth just in time. Maybe you know the 1995 film with Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, and Ed Harris. Um, let us take a look at the Kepner Trigo thinking processes now. The most relevant problem, uh, the most relevant process uh, with an AD is problem analysis. In discipline two and discipline four, uh, it's all about describing the problem and finding root cause. But the other fundamental Kepner Trigo processes, like decision analysis, potential problem or potential opportunity analysis, as well as situation appraisal, also have their role within an AD problem solving effort. Just about two years ago, the VDA, which stands for Verband der Automobilindustrie, or German Association of the Automotive Industry, has published a new standard in which it recommends to its members and the automotive industry as a whole the best practice on how to conduct an AD analysis. While I'm from Germany, and you might have heard of cars made in Germany, I understand that many of you are from the United States. So the German VDA and the American Automotive Industry Action Group uh, have launched a joint approach to standardize good quality AD problem solving, and you find a very similar problem solving guideline from the AIAG as well. Before we take a closer look, I would like to start a quick poll. Mm. 
So no matter if you are from the automotive industry or from somewhere else, how often do you use 8D analysis for problem solving? Please select one of the four answers. Do you always do it? Do you do it most of the time? Do you do it sometimes or actually never? And um, I'm waiting for like a half minute or so uh, for answers to come in. The first answers are coming in. And uh, I give you another like uh, 15 seconds to find the right, the right answer for you. So uh, many of you, more than half of you use uh, um, AD for problem solving most of the time. Nobody yet has said they do it always. Yeah, so the numbers are kind of stabilizing. Let's wait another 10 seconds or so. Yeah, there's already a few people also who do it always. All right, I'm going to stop the vote now. Let's take a look. So the numbers I have for now say that 4% of you always use 8D for problem solving. About 30% of you do it most of the time. That leaves 39% to do it sometimes, and about a quarter has never used um, AD analysis for problem solving. So um, there is uh, an interesting, how can I say, a gap upwards um, to uh, in, in embed AD problem solving more into some of your organizations. Um, let's move on and uh, take a closer look at the VDA uh, red book. Uh, the focus here is on D2, problem description, and discipline number four, root cause analysis. In these, um, in these um, places, in these disciplines, the VDA especially recommends use of kepner trigger processes. For all the disciplines, uh, there is a standard that has to be fulfilled uh, as a basic requirement within an audit. Mm. There are also criteria for achieving excellence that are at a higher standard. And uh, you see that uh, for D2 problem description, the, one of the basic requirements is that you use is and is not analysis. And the same is true for D4 root cause analysis. And there are even uh, advanced uh, criteria then for achieving excellence. Um, let us now do another poll where uh, we are going to ask uh, how satisfied are you with the quality and the duration of your AD analysis. Of course, that only applies to those of you that have answered that they at least sometimes use AD, um, use AD uh, problem analysis to solve problems. So uh, you have four answers here. Either you're very satisfied, you are somewhat satisfied, uh, you are somewhat dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. The poll is active, um, and you can enter your answers right now. Um, if you don't use AD analysis at all, then I would say it's not applicable and you select that choice. So let's see um, how the answers are coming in. Takes a little bit of time always. I'm seeing numbers coming in, but still the bars change quite significantly. Let's wait another 10 seconds about Okay, a few more votes. And then I'm going to close the poll. Let's take a look at the numbers. 10% uh, of you are very satisfied with their 8D analysis with the quality and the duration. Uh, about a quarter each is somewhat satisfied or somewhat dissatisfied, and 5% are really unhappy, they're very dissatisfied. And then one quarter, as we could expect after the first poll, um, for you it is not applicable because you don't use AD yet. All right, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at a case study. The case study is called Microcomputer Cabinets, and uh, you find, a, um, you find a, um, a PDF of that in the attachments. Uh, if you download it from the attachments, um, it'll take about four minutes to read this. Uh, if you don't want to download it or if you can't make it within the four minutes to get through the entire case study, that's no problem. 
because uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, the main items of that case study um, anyways right after that. So um, from now on, it's another approximately um, three and a half minutes for you to read. Um, many of you have already been in the attachment section and um, downloaded the case study microcomputer cabinet. Just um, open the PDF. You will see that the second page of that PDF is kind of uh, upwards, and you need to rotate that uh, by 90 degrees in your in your viewer. And I hope that shouldn't be a problem uh, to view it in the straight uh, orientation. Yeah, I'm not saying too much now to give you opportunity to read. If you have just joined, please go to the attachment section and download the case study microcomputer cabinets, take a look, and then in about two minutes, we're going to take a look together and familiarize ourselves with that case study and then see how Kepner Trego is and is not plays a major role within 8D to solve a problem there. Just reading. One more minute. Half a minute to go. Okay. Uh, if you've read it, you are you are now informed, but I'm going to go through this case study with all of you together. So uh, we are in a factory where we make three kinds of microcomputers, the 1025, 1035, and 1045. Uh, we are in the middle of a peak period, which is six weeks long, and production is increased each week. We make more 1025s than 1035s and 1045s combined. The 1025s are produced on line one. The 1035s and 1045s are both produced on line two. Each line has its own supply of components, which are assembled into the computer chassis. Components are tested during assembly. While the components are being assembled, the metal cabinets go through wash, paint, and dry operations. The cabinets are washed by dipping them in a cleaning solution that removes contaminants and oils. The cleaning solution is changed every half hour. Each line has two wash tanks. One is used while the other is drained and filled with fresh solution. The tanks on both lines are filled from a central supply tank. After washing, the cabinets are hung by hand on the line one and line two conveyors. The cabinets are hung from grounded hooks both conveyors move at the same speed through the paint booth. 
electrostatically charged paint is sprayed onto the cabinets and after painting the units enter the drying section. After drying, the cabinets go to final assembly. There the chassis are put into the cabinets. The finished units are then sent to quality control and then to shipping. Computers that are rejected in final inspection are sent to the rework sections. So now we have a problem. Over the last two weeks, we have a much higher reject rate for the 1025s because of gaps in the paint. The 1025 reject rate is normally 0.15%. It is currently over 6% and still rising. Every microcomputer goes through final inspection. But lately, a significant number of 1025s are being rejected periodically at final visual inspection due to gaps in the paint. The rejected cabinet may have as many as 11 different gaps in the paint coverage. These gaps appear randomly on the painted surface of the cabinets. This is frustrating for experienced people who saw the same kind of reject rate on 1025s during last year's peak period. After a few weeks then, they learned that some employees were wearing silicon hand cream, which can prevent paint from sticking. Management posted a list of acceptable hand creams in the washrooms, and within a week, the reject rate returned to normal. The reject rate for 1025 has been increasing over the last two weeks. The reject rate for the 1035s and 45s remains normal. The operation of the microcomputers is unaffected, but the units cannot be sent to customers. The rejected cabinets are stripped and repainted, so there is no increase in scrap. However, customers are complaining about late delivery of their 1025s. So how can we fix this problem? What we need here is 8D problem solving. Let's take a look one discipline at a time, but first another small survey. So this time in our survey, um, multiple answers are possible, and I would like to, uh, to ask you to use the questions from audience section to enter your answers to the question, what are the main difficulties you are experiencing during your AD analysis? So things that go wrong in your AD analysis, things that give you trouble. Um, could be it takes too long, could be you don't come to a resolution, but um, think of your own uh, issues that you have that make your life hard when you do AD analysis. And please use the questions from the audience and just type in there what comes to your mind and I'll give you about a minute for that. So please start now uh, just entering in the questions from audience section what you find difficult when you are doing an AD analysis. You can do this right now and uh, enter whatever difficulties you may have when you do an AD. Another 15 seconds to do that. Actually, the place where you should enter that is called ask from audience, ask a question, it's actually called, ask a question. So that's where you would need to enter that, um, that uh, difficulty that you face. I see a few people now have found that. Another 10 seconds if you want to enter something there. All right, so we've captured a few there and we can take a look at them. Eventually, you can keep entering uh, as we move forward, of course. Uh, but let's go on now and uh, start with the first discipline. So if we do an AD analysis around a problem, we start with D1 to put together a problem-solving team. That means uh, we have to identify the sponsor, who's the team leader, and also who are the team members or experts that are supposed to conduct this analysis. If we want to do that, we can use Kepner-Trago situation appraisal, especially the fourth step of the process, plan involvement. Here, we would select the right people to go through the analysis as a team. In D2 now, 
things get interesting. Uh, problem description. Problem description D2 is the uh, fundamental process step here to gather information about the problem. Uh, we set up the problem statement and specify the what, where, when extent and the is and is not. Uh, this is truly just nothing but kepner trigo problem analysis, especially the first step of that process describe problem. In its AT standard, the VDA requires us to set up a problem specification with is and is not. Since the autumn of this year, the VDA explicitly references kepner trigo for that. And you see images of uh, what the VDA suggests as questions to use, and you see the kepner trigo templates and process card, and see there is um, a great, a great um, coherence and similarity. If we want to do that for the microcomputer cabinets, this is what it could look like. So we have a problem statement at the top. It says microcomputer cabinets 1025 have paint gaps. On the left side, there is the is information. On the right side, you find the is not. You'll see that only 1025s have the problem. The 1035s and 1045s are not affected. We experience paint gaps. We could have also paint running, peeling, or discoloration, but that is not observed. Therefore, it's in the is not. The place where we find the defective computer cabinets is at final inspection. We have no reports of um, uh, paint gaps from final assembly. But we might want to ask a question there. So therefore, it says NMD need more data. You see that the paint gaps are randomly on the painted surface not in specific places, etc. So in this problem specification, we gather all the factual data uh, about the problem. Now that we have described the problem, we move on to discipline three, containment action. We want to eliminate the impact of the problem on the customer. So here, we can use Kepner-Trago decision analysis to select the most appropriate containment actions. Um, some containment actions that were um, suggested and that have been uh, selected here uh, would be uh, to send microcomputers with paint gaps to rework sec to the rework section, uh, to strip them of color, wash them, and return them into production, and also to inform key customers about late deliveries and to adjust the shipment schedule. So that would be our containment actions in this problem. Moving on to D4, root cause analysis. Here it's about uh, to identify possible causes that could explain the problem, then to evaluate these hypotheses against the previously captured factual information, and to get rid of all the causes that don't make sense, and then to identify which of the remaining possible causes is the most probable cause. In the final step, we would confirm the true cause. So, Again, we go back to kepner trigo problem analysis. These are exactly the next uh, three steps of the process. And uh, the VDA, again, suggests uh, various approaches to identify possible causes. And uh, again, they explicitly require the use of kepner trigo is and is not. Uh, you see that uh, concepts like the five whys or an Ishikawa cause and effect diagram, uh, they represent sub-steps within this kepner trigo analysis, and uh, they are just helping us to come to a good problem statement and to identify possible causes from knowledge and experience. Um, it is also possible and recommended by the VDA uh, to identify possible causes from distinctions and changes. So by asking what's different between the is and is not and what has changed, um, we actually do find a few uh, distinctions here between the is and is not, and we also see changes, and that can also help us to identify possible causes. So as an example, uh, we might have come to identify three possible causes in this case, usually in a real problem, and even in this case study, we would have more ideas than three, but I want to keep it a little simple here. So one possible cause that is already suggested in the text is that operators use silicon hand cream, and then they touch the cabinets and the paint doesn't stick could also be that hooks are not properly grounded, so the electrostatically uh, charged paint doesn't stick to the cabinet. Another possible cause would be that the cleaning solution is contaminated, 
before the 30 minutes uh, are over and therefore it doesn't clean uh, properly anymore. So out of a multitude of possible causes, we now want to get rid of those that don't make sense. And we do this by comparing uh, the possible causes against the facts in the is and is not specification. And uh, if we do that, we find that first of all, ungrounded hooks can be eliminated as a cause of the problem because they would create a different kind of deviation. They would create a completely unpainted cabinet. So that means this cause would be contradicting the problem specification. Each of the two other causes would basically be possible, but under a different number of assumptions and with assumptions that have more or less probability. So we can use this information now, particularly the assumptions that we have noted, to identify the most probable cause. And we come to the conclusion that the most probable cause in this case would be the cleaning solution is contaminated before the 30 minutes are over. In the final step of problem analysis now, confirm true cause, we would have to uh, find a way to confirm that our uh, most probable cause is the real, co the real cause, the true cause. And uh, there's various ways of doing that. Uh, one would be to just go and see, to observe. So uh, we could go to the line one wash tank and we could take a look at the end of the 30 minutes and we would see that uh, the cleaning solution is already really dirty at that time. The final cabinets are no longer washed properly and the paint comes out with gaps after drying so that we can do to confirm true cause. Now, before we move on to the other disciplines, uh, a final poll for you. Uh, when you do your 8D analysis, do you already use is and is not? And uh, I'm going to uh, start the poll now. Uh, you can start voting now. Uh, four possible, five possible answers actually. Um, do you always use is and is not when you specify a problem? Do you do that most of the time? Do you only sometimes do that? Or do you never do it? And of course, if you are in the quarter that um, does not do AD analysis anyways, uh, then the question doesn't make sense and it would be not applicable. So yes, please uh, start um, clicking on the, on the appropriate answer that applies to you. Um, I see slowly some votes are coming in, but still more room and more time required. When you do an eight day analysis, do you use is and is not? Let's have another like um, 15 seconds for that. There's still votes coming in. All right, no further change. Let's stop the poll and take a look at the numbers. Mm. I see that 5% approximately um, always uses and is not in an AD analysis and about 29% uh, do that most of the time. So that is like 35% uh, altogether. 36% um, of you sometimes uses and is not and 15 do never do that. And of course, you must know that if you want to do an AD analysis that is um, that is um, uh, concurrent with uh, KT, uh, sorry, with KT with um, VDA standards, then you must use it. And it's not that's a basic requirement uh, within an audit in that um, in that process. So let's uh, move on and take a look at the uh, other four disciplines. Uh, they go somewhat uh, faster now. Uh, Discipline number five, uh, selection and verification of corrective action, another application of decision analysis. And um, there could be a number of, um, of corrective actions that are um, suggested. For example, we could increase the line speed. Uh, we could change the cleaning solution in the line one wash tank every 20 minutes. We could use a new wash solvent or we could use a new acid wash pretreatment. Um, so many possible fixes that are suggested, uh, decision analysis will help us find the best one of them. And uh, in this case, that would be to change the cleaning solution in line one wash tank every 20 minutes. Um, now that we have uh, selected uh, a corrective action, 
it is in D6 about implementation and validation of these corrective actions. Uh, in KT, we call that try a fix and monitor. So um, if we implement this uh, fix that we selected, uh, as soon as we start changing the cleaning solutions in line one every 20 minutes, uh, there are no longer any paint gaps. So um, we have effectively gotten rid of the problem. Uh, in D7, we now want to think about prevention of reoccurrence. We want to think beyond the fix. We want to make sure that we learn from this experience and make sure that in the future uh, things go better for us. This is um, application of some elements of Kepner Trago potential problem analysis. And um, as we do that, um, as we prevent reoccurrence, uh, we use uh, an approach that we call think beyond the fix in Kepner Trago. So there's basically five questions that we ask. Um, what other damage could this cause create? Where else could this cause create problems? What is the cause of the cause? And then on the side of the fix, what identical things need the same fix? And what problems could this fix cause? And you see some answers to these questions here on the slide. The final step of an 8D process is finalization and acknowledgement of the team success. And here we use elements of the Kepner Trego performance system. So feedback is important for continuous improvement. And we make sure that all actions from D3, D5, and D6 are finished, that the report is available and approved by the sponsor and the team leader, and that the team effort has been acknowledged. And once we've done that, we have completed our 8D analysis. Uh, this entire AD analysis can be documented in an A3 form. So here is an example, actually in German, uh, of, a, of a, an A3 form that I designed for a life science enterprise in Germany. Um, if you see how small the print is, you might want to print it even larger than A3, but all the information from the A process steps are found in this, um, in this one single sheet. As a conclusion, I would like to point out that the VDA, the German Car Maker Association, requires Kepner Trego is and is not for discipline two, problem description, and for discipline four, root cause analysis. But the Kepner Trego processes are also useful in many other, and actually in all the other disciplines. Um, Kepner Trego can support you in your AD analysis. And here's what we offer. We can audit your AD analysis. If you send us a handful, uh, we'll take a look and tell you what is going well and what can be improved. We conduct in-house training for you, both virtually via the internet as well as on your premises. We also offer training in public sessions, again, virtually as well as uh, in a classroom. And we do support the implementation of these processes in your company. If you want to find out more about that, please contact us or visit our website at www.kepnertrego.com slash lp slash 8d. Uh, please also take a look at the attachment to this Bright Talk. So you will find the PowerPoint slides, two links to the VDA webshop and to the 8d page on kepnertrego.com. Uh, yeah, so I'm at the end of my presentation here and I hand over to my colleague David Kossoff to round this all up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all for attending. Now to close this out and to move you along to the next item on your to-do list, we have just a few parting items. Um, actually, I'm just going to ask Mr. Burkhardt Priggy if you'd like to answer any questions that have come up from the audience. Yes, of course. So you can enter your questions again uh, in the appropriate field on your screen. Yeah, that's great, Parker. So I, I noticed that there are a number of folks that have already asked questions. Mm -hmm. You can take a look at, um, at these over here. One at the top actually spoke about how do you establish possible causes avoiding correlation? Well, um, it can be that the possible cause is just a correlation. 
and we are going to check it against the facts in the is and is not um, to see um, how does it explain not only that, that there is a correlation, but there is a causation. And we'll see that some things come out as, well, might happen, but no, no real cause effect relationship visible, whereas others have a clear explanation of how the cause created uh, the effect. And that's something that we require of a possible cause that it has itself an object, a deviation, and an explanation. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we've got another one here that speaks. It says, can a containment action be to install more quality, quality inspection checkpoints in the production line? If the issue is detected, send it to a rework process? Yeah, that is a, you know, in D3, when you have um, identified the problem and uh, before you even get to the cause, that's a typical containment action that you do a sorting action. You just... Uh, look at all the parts that are defective and you send them back to rework so they don't end up at the customer. And of course, that can only be temporary. So you need to really get uh, to the root cause in D4 and find out uh, why the problem occurred. So then you can take um, corrective action against uh, the cause itself and the problem will disappear. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question here about fish bones and five lies. And the question is, how do you avoid correlation using fishbone and five whys? Well, first of all, five whys in the beginning is really to ask uh, why does this occur? And if the situation is simple and you ask why, 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 and you come to an obvious answer, then the rest of the process is really straightforward and you just have found a, a simple cause to a simple problem. Oftentimes, you come to a point where asking five whys brings you to a place where the answer is don't know. Like... Uh, we have a uh, delayed shipment of 1025s. Why? Because we have a high reject rate. Why? Because we have paint gaps. Why do we have paint gaps? Oh, no, I don't know. And then you can start your problem analysis in the first place. So that's where the five whys have their place to come to an easy answer or to come to a cause unknown deviation where you can start problem analysis. Um, if you look at a fishbone diagram, that is really just a thought starter. That's a, an idea generator. You have described the problem in D2, now, in D4, you ask what could possibly cause this problem. And anything that has an object, a deviation, and an explanation to it is, first of all, accepted as a possible cause because then we are going to test the possible cause against the is and is not and thereby get rid of all the possible causes that don't make sense and find out which of the remaining possible causes is the most probable one. It is no... Um, no issue, no difficulty if a possible cause that comes out from the fishbone diagram is untrue or doesn't make sense or is merely a correlation. The testing of the possible cause afterwards is going to filter that out. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Burkhardt, <clears throat> another question here on how is KT similar, or should I say, how similar is KT to Red X? All right. Red X is from the Shaney methodology, where um, you kind of look at it is and is not situation. You look for the best of the best and the worst of the worst, which has some thinking of KT in it. Um, it's somewhat difficult, different because in Shining you mainly look at objects, and you, in KT you look at the what, where, when extent. So you have the object, the deviation, the place where it occurs, the timing, and all the extent information. So there is a, a similarity in that, but also differences. The red X is the most probable cause in a Shining analysis, and um, yeah, uh, you get that by comparing um, how your data fits to that or that hypothesis. Um, shining is usually implying, uh, well, em employing, I must say, using uh, a lot of statistical analysis, which is effective when you have large number of objects where there are only few of them have a deviation. So their statistical processes are quite useful and you can use them within KT as well. I understand that this is difficult if you have a single occurrence deviation. Let's say uh, 
the sinking of the Titanic or the explosion of a tank in a spaceship, uh, spaceship or those kind of events where statistical analysis doesn't yield any you know, good information. Um, KT works in both. Yeah, those, those events are, are two that certainly we wouldn't like to have any more of in the future. Thank you for that answer. Um, <laughs> so we actually have a, a bit of a comment and a question, and we'll get in touch with this person. Um, what they say is, I would like to introduce KT in, to my organization. I've used KT techniques for years with much success. Thank you for that. We'll be in touch with you to, uh, to help you out on that. Um, another question here. Talking about the AD technique, does Kepner Trigo have a book that I could buy? Well, Kepner and Trigo, they wrote a book in 1965 that's called The Rational Manager. And it has been uh, rewritten or um, improved in 1990, The New Rational Manager. And since then, Kepner, Trigo, Kepner and Trigo both don't write books anymore because, I mean, they, um, they don't write anything. Uh, at these days, they... Um, they had a long, long life, but uh, no more new books. Um, yes, so this this book, the the new rational manager, is a classic book that uh, that is available, uh, and it is part of our training materials. So if you come to KT and you get trained in our processes, then uh, this book is part of the um, well uh, materials that we are going to uh, give all our learners. Great. Um, so uh, oh, bear with me for a second. I have. Um... Oh, great. Here, there's another great question here. If you analyze the problem and somehow this problem disappears, what actions do you do then? Or how do you finish the, anal the analysis of it? Well, uh, before you even start analyzing a problem, you ask three questions. So the, question, the first question is, do we have a deviation? So something that is not quite right. Second, is the cause unknown? If we already know the cause, then certainly we would look for the cause of the cause, but not for the immediate one. And third is, do I need to know the cause to take effective action? And that depends. If you have a problem, it's there for a while and it disappears. Then it might be that you don't have to bother anymore. Everything is good and you, you busy yourself with other things in your life, and that's fine. But oftentimes, when something went wrong for a certain time, and now it's back to good, you still have to find the cause because it might come back because authorities demand from you that you find the cause of that deviation, even though it's not present at the moment. And um, well, uh, just so that you understand what's going on in your environment even better. So therefore, uh, you could still, of course, analyze a problem from the past that has gone away. Hopefully, you have captured some data at the time when the problem occurred, because it's much more difficult to remember stuff that happened in the past than to look at your notes and your your charts and your um, your um, data that you have captured at the time when the problem occurred. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, lots of great questions here. Uh, do you use timeline cause and effect methods within the process? And in what cases is it usable, if yes? Well, uh, we look at timeline, yes, uh, when it comes to using distinctions and changes. We also all, all the time want to take a look at when a change occurred. We all understand that cause often comes from change. So everything was good, something has changed that created a problem. And uh, when we want to find the cause, we want to find the relevant change, we take a look at uh, when these changes occurred. So timelines are important, but it's not the only tool that helps us to find causes. We can also find cause in invariant things over time, distinctions that have then um, uh, experienced the change and that led to cause. All right, great, thank you very much. So um, we're gonna bring the Q&A to an end. There's still a, a number here and the ones that we didn't get to, we will get in touch with you to give you an answer to these questions. Thank you all so much for for the enormous amount of participation and the questions that we had here so far. Uh, that's just great to see. So we want to get you on to, uh, to finishing up your day or, or whatever's next for you. Um, please understand that we take these sessions seriously and um, we want to know if you found this valuable. So please do, before you leave this webinar, use the rate this button on your console and let us know what you think.
Um, also, we will follow up through email with a recorded copy of this presentation, which is yours to revisit or share with your colleagues. And we will also be providing some additional articles for your review. So um, we want to just uh, let you know that feel free to contact Burkhard Prigge uh, with any questions that you have on this topic or reach out to Captain Trigo. Um, and on behalf of Burkhardt and Captain Trigo and myself, thank you again for your time and we wish you a great day. Thank you.